Our grave exploration starts here on Washington Boulevard in Culver City, California. There isn't much to see here. In fact, this street is entirely unremarkable. But if we could turn back the clock 90 years, we would be looking at the front office of Hal Roach Studios. Among the people going inside, we might see Will Rogers and Lionel Barrymore. A lady and a gentleman passing by could be Thelma Todd and Charlie Chase. Or, if we were lucky, we might catch a glimpse of the haunting Jean Harlow. And if we timed it just right, it's possible that Laurel and Hardy, the crown princes of comedy, would glance our way as they drove up in their motor cars. At one time or another, they all worked at Hal Roach's Laugh Factory, as it was called. Today it's all gone, except for this small plaque. But for one all too brief period of time, some of the most beloved comedies were made right here. The films that have stood the test of time were those made by Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. They appeared together in over 100 short and feature films and are regarded as the greatest comedy duo of all time. But by no means did they achieve this alone. Through it all, they were joined by scores of writers, directors, musicians, and actors who worked tirelessly to bring laughter to the world when it needed it the most. Some of their co-stars had been famous in their day, but most were bit players or character actors whose faces were more recognizable than their names. But today, these talented people are almost entirely forgotten. But we're going to change that in the course of a two-part video series. We will travel to cemeteries across Southern California and visit their final resting places and examine their lives and look at the contributions they made to the work of Laurel and Hardy. All right, let's dust off our derbies, fire up the old Model T, and come walk, no, come laugh with me as we travel far and wide into the slapstick world of Stan and Ollie. Our first visit is at San Fernando Mission Cemetery in Mission Hills, California. The grounds feature many religious works of art, from sculptures to these mid-century mosaics by ecclesiastical artist Dame Isabel Pitzek. Here in Section E is the Statue of the Holy Family, which is only a short walk to the resting place of Anita Garvin Stanley. Notice how the birth year on her headstone is incomplete. What would a lady be without her secrets? Anita Garvin began in show business at age 12 by lying about her age to become one of Max Sennett's bathing beauties. From there it was on to the Zigfield Follies, where an accidental slip and fall on stage changed her life. Luckily she wasn't hurt, but the spill got a laugh, and she was on her way to becoming a comedy icon. Later she signed with Hal Roach Studios, and would appear in 11 Laurel and Hardy films, from Love and Hisses in 1927 to A Chump at Oxford in 1939. The six-foot-tall Anita Garvin was teamed with four-foot-eleven Marion Byron in a short series of films that were a female version of Laurel and Hardy. Perhaps her most memorable appearance with the boys was in Blotto, produced by Hal Roach in 1930. She plays Stan's ever-watchful wife, who wants to keep him from going out with his ne'er-do-well friend, Ollie. The boys concoct an idea whereby Stan can slip away on the pretext of being called out on important business.
but Mrs. Laurel is on to them, and means to foil their plans. With the country still under the yoke of prohibition, the boys try to be as discreet with the bottle as possible, which goes off in hysterical Stan and Ollie fashion. With the bottle open, they get on with the business of having a good time. A while later, Mrs. Laurel arrives at the nightclub, just in time to hear them getting in a hearty laugh at her expense. But the merriment is at its end once her presence is discovered, and she reveals to them what we already know. And then she reveals another surprise. She's a crack shot. Anita retired from films in 1940 to raise a family. In later life, she became a regular attendee at meetings of the Sons of the Desert an organization dedicated to preserving and advancing the memory of all things Laurel and Hardy. Our next stop brings us to Oddfellow Cemetery in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of East Los Angeles. Established in the 1880s by the Independent Order of Oddfellows, the cemetery continues to serve the city's dynamic community. Among the headstones, old and new, is a small rose garden marked with two concrete pillars. If you read the bronze plaques, you will see one for silver screen comedian Billy Gilbert. As the plaque suggests, Billy sneezed his way to stardom. Yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can. <laughs> but his comic talents went far beyond that and made him a favorite on the vaudeville stage. And it was there that he was seen by Stan Laurel. Impressed, he brought Gilbert out west to Hal Roach Studios, where he appeared with many of their top acts, like Charlie Chase, Thelma Todd, and the R Gang comedies. Billy had a knack for mimicking dialects, which he put to use in two Laurel and Hardy classics from 1932. First was as the high-strung doctor in the county hospital. I hope I find you well. Thank you, ma'am. Gee. And then, as the piano-hating, axe-wielding Professor von Schwarzenhofen in the Academy Award-winning two-reeler, The Music Box. In all, Billy Gilbert co-starred with Laurel and Hardy 11 times. On his own, he appeared in over 200 films until his retirement. In 1937, he lent his voice and famous sneeze to Walt Disney as Sneezy 
in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. In 1940, he was cast as Herring in The Great Dictator, Charlie Chaplin's send-up of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. Billy's ashes were scattered in this quiet garden where roses bloom. One can only hope that he's not allergic. <laughs> Our walk continues at Valhalla Memorial Park in North Hollywood, California. If you've been following my videos, you might remember this location. In case you haven't seen my previous exploration here, I will include a link to take you to it. Valhalla is significant for being the resting place of Oliver Hardy, who we will visit in the next video in this series. Sorry, Ollie. Two of Babe's frequent co-stars share resting places here as well. The first is Sam Lufkin, who after a few minor scrapes with the law as a youth, traded his hometown of Salt Lake City for Hollywood, where he worked odd jobs until finding his way into motion pictures, playing bit parts. While at Hal Roach Studios, he worked with Laurel and Hardy in 39 films. His stony features were perfectly suited for playing menacing cops, which he did to wonderful effect in the music box. Are you going to stand for that? Say, listen, if he'd have said one more word to me, I would have... <laughs> now let that be another lesson to you. Say, listen, don't you think you're bounding over your steps? What do you mean, bounding over my step? <laughs> Why, he means uh, overstepping your bounds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now let that be a lesson to you. Ooh! In all, Sam appeared in 170 films, working until his untimely death in 1952. Our visit now brings us to the grave of Baldwin Cook. Born in New York, he and his wife Alice started in showbiz on the vaudeville stage, where the couple frequently toured with Stan Laurel. After moving to Hollywood in the 20s, he went on to appear in 30 Laurel and Hardy films. Some of his appearances were minor, as when he played the waiter in Blotto, but occasionally he was given the chance to stand out, like when he played the brick-throwing neighbor in the perfect day. Hello, is this you, Ollie? Hello, Cookie. In Be Big, Baldwin plays the boy's lodge brother, who persuades them to concoct a story to break off plans with their wives so they can attend a stag party instead. Yeah, the whole gang here in full regalia were waiting for you. I'm sorry. We've made arrangements to take our wives to Atlantic City for the weekend, and nothing can stop it. As encouragement, he offers this nugget of wisdom. Remember the old saying, no man is bigger than the excuses he can make to his wife. So don't forget, be big. Get me? Be big. What could possibly go wrong, right? Baldwin Cook remained close friends with both Stan and Babe until he passed away on New Year's Eve, 1953. Our travels bring us now to Hollywood Forever Cemetery in the movie capital of the world. The list of famous names interred within its gates is seemingly endless. But the cemetery dates to a time before the first studios opened for business in the city. Our first visit brings us to the south wall that separates the cemetery from Paramount Studios. And here we find Harry Bernard. He was a veteran actor who got his break in pictures with Max Sennett. His association with Hal Roach and Laurel and Hardy began in 1928 with Two Tars and continued through 26 films. He is most commonly seen playing befuddled cops, as in our relations. Could you tell us where Danker's beer garden is? Sure. Just around the corner there. 
Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me, officer. Me too. It's all right. Harry's final appearance with Stan and Ollie was in Saps at Sea, released the same year as his untimely death. Of all the heavies that Laurel and Hardy encountered, there was none more menacing than Walter Long. Known for playing villains, Walter Long's versatility allowed him to work in both drama and comedy genres. His busy film career reached back to 1910, and he can be seen in such films as The Birth of a Nation and alongside actors like Rudolph Valentino and John Barrymore. Between 1931 and 1934, he made five films with Laurel and Hardy, and unlike their usual foils, Long brought unpredictability and danger to his performances. What are you in for? We're a couple of beer barons. <laughs> and nowhere is this more evident than in this climactic scene from Pardon Us, where his character attempts a chilling assault on the warden's daughter. Ah. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty as charged. And they took no chances in going bye-bye, as a straight-jacketed Long hears the court's verdict, as well as a poorly timed question from one of the star witnesses. Aren't you going to hang him? in the court! You dirty double-cross and squealers. You rats. I'll get even with you if it's the last thing I ever do. Off-camera, Walter Long was the exact opposite of the villainous characters he played. He served his country in two world wars and retired from the army with the rank of colonel. He was a lifelong member and the commander of the American Legion's Hollywood Post 43. Paramount Studios' water tower is in clear view from the resting place of veteran character actor Charles Middleton. With his deep voice and sinister presence, he was often cast as a heavy. And beginning in 1931, he made four appearances with Laurel and Hardy. In Bohunks, he was the commander of the Foreign Legion, who was every bit as hard-nosed as he was loony. A year later, he played the villainous child welfare officer in Pack Up Your Troubles. What's it to you? As an officer in the East Side Welfare Association, I intend to place that child in an orphanage where she belongs. Over our dead body, you'll put her in an orphanage. Then he was the jealous husband in the Fixer Uppers, who was determined to defend the honor of his wife, played by May Bush. Here in this room, we will meet in mortal combat, a duel to the death. Are you ready, monsieur? Oui, monsieur. Yes, we pray. We've got to get out of here. Not until I dispose of the body. I am going to cut him up into little pieces. Middleton's last co-starring role with the boys was in The Flying Deuces in 1939. By then he was already well established in the role of evil Emperor Ming in the adventure serial Flash Gordon, starring Buster Crabbe.
Our final visit at Hollywood Forever is to Bobby Dunn. With more than 250 film credits reaching back to the early silent days, he appeared with some of the greatest comics of the day, like Fatty Arbuckle, Harold Lloyd, Ben Turpin, and W.C. Fields. How do you do? Who's that fella? He began his performance career as an acrobat, doing leaps and jumps at amusement parks until an accident resulted in the loss of an eye. The glass eye he wore thereafter gave him a distinct appearance that he used for laughs, as we can see in Me and My Pal. Bobby made 10 films with Laurel and Hardy and had a memorable part in Tit for Tat as the kleptomaniac who cleans out Stan and Ollie's electronics store while they carry on their feud with Charlie Hall. How do you do? One of Bobby's final screen appearances before he left us at the young age of 46 was in 1937's Way Out West. Our exploration brings us now to Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Hollywood Hills. Throughout these beautiful acres are several key friends and collaborators of Stan and Ollie. Our first visit is on Evergreen Drive in front of the Church of the Hills. Daphne Pollard's career began on the stage in her native Australia before coming to the United States in 1901. Her performances in musical comedies on Broadway, London's West End, and in Paris received rave reviews. In 1927, she made her motion picture debut with Max Sennett, and between 1935 and 1943, Daphne appeared with Stan and Babe four times. Don't get so, honey. I was only kidding. She was memorably cast as Ollie's termagant wife From in Thicker on, Than Water, where for a little lady, she had a very big bite. Be running along. Come on, Stanley. Goodbye, honey. No. Goodbye. What are you going to do? Cook something? Yes. I'm going to cook his goose. Daphne retired from motion pictures in 1943. One of her last appearances was with Laurel and Hardy in The Dancing Masters that featured a young Robert Mitchum. Charlie Rogers has nearly 30 Laurel and Hardy credits in three different categories, acting, writing, and directing. In Double Whoopee, he is seen fawning over a prince styled after Eric von Stroheim. He had them running for cover as the parson in The Perfect Day. And he played Jimmy Finlayson's congested valet in Pack Up Your Troubles. Roger, do you smell anything? Dosa. I've got a coat of bedos. Hmm. Uh, no grapefruit this morning, Rogers. Charlie appeared with other Hal Roach stars as well, including Harry Langdon in the early 1940s. As a writer, he contributed gags to Laurel and Hardy and to other Hal Roach productions. Charlie also directed or was the assistant director on nine of the boys' films, including Them Thar Hills and its sequel, Tit for Tat. Charlie's last contribution to Laurel and Hardy was as a writer in 1943's Air Raid Wardens, made after the team's move to MGM Studios. 
He remained active in show business until his untimely death in an automobile accident on December 20th, 1956. In Forest Lawn's Court of Remembrance is the resting place of Liberace, music's flashiest, if not greatest, showman. And if you look to the right from his sarcophagus, you will find another musician who has cemented his place in the hearts of all Laurel and Hardy fans. As Marvin Hatley's plaque states, he was the composer of Laurel and Hardy's theme song. The dance of the cuckoos blends so perfectly to the team's comedic timing that it's hard to believe it wasn't intended for them. It was originally the hourly chime for Roach Studios' radio station. The story goes that Stan Laurel heard the tune and immediately appropriated it, and the rest is history. Marvin was a gifted musician who could play almost any instrument, and his talents were used whenever a script called for an instrument to be played on screen. The actor would pretend to play as Marvin dubbed the music in live by playing the real instrument just off camera. This was done with Stan's harmonium in Below Zero. and with the player piano in the music box. Marvin had a busy career with Hal Roach, composing hundreds of scores, songs, and incidental pieces. Some of his songs include Honolulu Baby for the Sons of the Desert and Will You Be My Lovey Dovey for Way Out West. His score for the latter picture was nominated for an Academy Award in 1938. As our exploration continues, we come to writer-director Hal Yates. He had only one credit with Laurel and Hardy as the director of 1927's Hats Off. The story revolves around Stan and Ollie as door-to-door -door washing machine salesmen who must lug their stock up a long flight of stairs. Later, a mix-up of hats turns into a small riot on the streets of Culver City. Sadly, no prints of the film that co-starred James Finlayson and Anita Garvin are known to exist. All we have are these few production stills that give us a glimpse at what it looked like. The basic premise of the story, as well as the filming location, was revamped five years later as the music box. Hal Yates' career behind the camera lasted until early television when he directed episodes of the series My Little Margie, starring Gail Storm. High up on this shady slope is the grave of celebrated director George Stevens. Long before he took the director's seat, he was a camera operator for Hal Roach and shot more than 25 of Laurel and Hardy's earliest films, including the aforementioned Hats Off. Among his other credits are Putting Pants on Philip. The High-Rise Antics of Liberty, as well as the boys' two early hits, Big Business and Two Tars.
George Stevens left Roach Studios in 1930 and went on to win two Academy Awards for Best Director for A Place in the Sun in 1951 and for Giant in 1956. And he was nominated for Shane in 1954 and The Diary of Anne Frank in 1959. Forest Lawn in Hollywood Hills is also the resting place of Stan Laurel, who occupies a scenic spot in the Court of Liberty. Unfortunately, he'll have to wait until the next video before we stop for a visit. Come on, Stan, it's not so bad. Give us a little smile. Before we leave these tranquil grounds, Let's walk a short distance from Stan and pay our respects to the great Buster Keaton. He never worked with the boys, but they shared a deep mutual admiration for one another. Buster is a sorely underrated comic genius whose influence is still felt in the present day. He had no equals, only imitators. May he rest in peace. Fairhaven Memorial Park in the heart of Orange County has been in operation for more than a century. Our walk here takes us to a quiet corner where rests an important player in Laurel and Hardy's early history. Clyde Bruckman began his movie career as a gag writer for Buster Keaton. It was Clyde who brought him an incredible story about a locomotive chase that happened during the Civil War. It inspired Keaton to adapt it into what became his magnum opus, The General. Buster gave him a co-directing credit on the film, explaining later that he wanted to enhance his friend's resume, and it worked, getting Bruckman writing and directing jobs with some of the top comedy producers of the day, including Hal Roach. Bruckman had no real directing experience, but he was able to learn on the job. One of his projects for Roach Studios was 1927's Putting Pants on Philip. It was the first film to bill Stan and Ollie as a double act. Although it was billed as such, the characters weren't quite what we now recognize as classic Laurel and Hardy, but there were glimmers of what was to come. Later the same year, Bruckman directed the boys in Battle of the Century, it's remembered for having the largest pie fight in film history. It was said that 3,000 pies were used in this scene. Bruckman's last directorial contribution to Laurel and Hardy was Leave Em Laughing in 1928. By then the team had found their characters and were well on their way to the top. But the same cannot be said for Clyde Bruckman. After many professional and personal setbacks, including the death of his first wife, he descended into an alcoholic spiral that left him a broken man. During the holiday season of 1954, Clyde went to see his old pal and mentor, Buster Keaton. Before leaving, he asked for a pistol to take on a hunting trip he had planned. Buster loaned him the gun without hesitation. It was the last time he would ever see Clyde Bruckman. On January 4, 1955, the old comedy director and gag writer entered a public restroom in a Santa Monica cafe and shot himself. In his pocket, police found a typewritten note asking that his body be donated to science because, he wrote, he could not afford a funeral. But somehow, Clyde ended up here, in this quiet corner of Fairhaven Memorial Park.
Grandview Memorial Park has been serving the city of Glendale since 1884. And here among the graves of pioneers and Civil War veterans is actress Dorothy Coburn. She was a petite redhead with a fiery disposition who proved herself to be a worthy adversary to the bad boy antics of Stan and Ollie. In Putting Pants on Philip, Dorothy is pursued by girl-crazy, kilt-wearing Stanley and manages to quash Oliver's flirtations with a quick flick to the proboscis. Even Stan's token of Scottish chivalry fails to impress. Oh well, better luck next time. Then, in Finishing Touch, Dorothy plays a no-nonsense nurse who gets her point across that if you're going to make a noise, you better make it quietly. Dorothy was an experienced athlete, and whether the part called for her to fall in wet plaster or get plastered with pies, splashed with mud, or wrestle a Stone Age Stan Laurel, she was up for it. She made 11 appearances with Laurel and Hardy, but by the time motion pictures changed over to sound, Dorothy had all but given up acting. Although her name has slipped from memory, her contributions to silent era comedy will never be forgotten. In Grandview's mausoleum are two giants of silent movies. One is Charlie Chaplin's leading lady and lover, Edna Proviance, and the other is comedian Harry Langdon. In 1949, Life magazine listed him along with Chaplin, Keaton, and Lloyd as one of the greatest clowns of comedy's golden era. Most of his career was spent on the vaudeville stage. Audiences roared with laughter at his wide-eyed, childlike character who traversed outlandish situations in complete naivete. When his act came to the movies in a series of films produced by Max Sennett, he was an instant success. By 1930, he was working at Roach Studios, where he not only produced material for his own films, but for others as well. Langdon contributed gags to many of the studio's top comedians, including Laurel and Hardy. In 1939, he co-starred with Oliver Hardy and an elephant in Zenobia. Look here, I'm not an elephant, Doctor. Oh, well, then Stan Laurel, who was locked in a contract dispute with Hal Roach, did not appear in the movie. Ah, uh, no. Why? Although Harry and Ollie give fine performances, and the film is not without its merits, Zenobia failed to connect with the public, and it flopped miserably. Harry stayed busy performing until his death at age 60. Although the mausoleum was closed on the day of our visit, we can still pay our respects to a man who contributed so much to making the world a happier place. As our walk continues, we come to Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California which is only a few miles away from where Hal Roach's Laugh Factory was located. Opened in 1938, Holy Cross is the resting place of many Hollywood greats, from Bing Crosby to Rita Hayworth and John Ford to John Candy. The centerpiece of these peaceful grounds is the Grand Mausoleum. Our first visit is to James Morton, who appeared in nine Laurel and Hardy films, especially when the part called for a policeman. 
In tit for tat, he settles the long-running feud between Charlie Hall and the boys. He did. I did not. You better apologize to this gentleman. I will not. Oh, yes, you will, or I'll run you in. Well, all right, but don't let it happen again. No hard feelings. He also played Jimmy Finlayson's crooked bartender in Way Out West. Hey, this thing ain't working right. It's working all right for me. However, today's comedy fans will most likely recognize him and his toupee from the Three Stooges classic, Disorder in the Court. Tarantula. Shut five holes in a divot. Get out of here. Go on. Watch the five good slugs in it. I'll sue you for this. Oh, superstitious, eh? Morton's career spanned 13 years and over 200 appearances in short and feature films. If anyone has the unenviable distinction of being the poster child for first world frustration, it was veteran actor Edgar Kennedy. He was the master of the slow burn, whose character was an average Joe who through a series of mounting frustrations found himself being driven to the mental breaking point. Did you say something, Mr. Kennedy? Yes. Wait till I get my hands on that brother-in-law of mine. He's responsible for this! Beginning in 1928, producer Hal Roach matched Kennedy's talents as a human pressure cooker with the dim-witted antics of Laurel and Hardy. He made nine films with the boys, and among his memorable appearances is as the gout-suffering Uncle Edgar in 1929's Perfect Day. Each instance of foot stomping gets more painful than the last. Pull it out. Also in 1929, he played Thelma Todd's misbehaving husband in Laurel and Hardy's first the talkie, Unaccustomed waiting. As We Are. So, little dicky bird is waiting. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't you Edgar don't also worked behind the camera, directing two of Laurel and Hardy's silent two-reelers, from Soup to Nuts, and Your Darn Tootin'. Kennedy appeared in hundreds of films, with a vast array of talent, from the Marx Brothers to Rex Harrison. Here he is losing his cool over Charlie Chaplin in a film Johnny, made in 1914. And for RKO, he starred in the long-running comedy series, The Average Man. He remained one of Hollywood's busiest actors until his untimely death at age 58. Academy Award winning director Leo McCary is probably best known for directing the 1957 romance An Affair to Remember, starring Cary Grant and Deborah Carr. He has Best Director Oscars for The Awful Truth and Going My Way. Like George Stevens, McCary honed his trade working for Hal Roach Studios in the silent movie era. While there, he primarily worked with comedian Charlie Chase. However, he directed three Laurel and Hardy pictures, We Faw Down, Liberty, and Wrong Again. In addition, he either wrote or supervised direction on many of their other projects. From Stan and Ollie's first pairing, McCary recognized the chemistry they had together and helped develop them as a team. Your good friend, director Leo McCary. Yeah. In a 1954 appearance on the television show, This Is Your Life, McCary told the story of how Oliver Hardy was cast opposite Stan Laurel. Well, um, it seems that uh, Babe was uh, cooking a leg of lamb and uh, for some reason, um, he left his arm in the oven too long or something. 
And uh, he got it so badly blistered that uh, we had to cut down his part in yeah. the next picture, so we decided to put Stan in the picture, too, to bolster up the comedy. Yeah. And, and uh, so when we saw the two of them on the screen together, we decided there's a real team. McCary left Roach Studios in the early 30s, but his mark on some of the greatest comedies was well and truly made. Located in LA's posh west side, Los Angeles National Cemetery was dedicated in 1889 and is the resting place of military veterans from the Mexican-American War to the present day. Beneath the flagpole in the heart of the cemetery is the Columbarium. Inside rests Arthur Hausman, a U.S. Navy veteran of World War I, but movie fans will likely recognize him from his staggering number of film appearances. And I do mean staggering. For more than a decade, Artie Hausman made a career out of playing drunkards on the silver screen. He began acting on the New York stage when he was still a teenager. In 1912, he began making films for Edison Studios. When Edison began experimenting with the kinetophone, an early attempt to make talking pictures, Artie's face and voice was featured front and center as the interlocutor in Edison's Minstrels, produced in 1913. Grand finale by the entire company. He appeared in supporting roles throughout the 20s. By the end of the decade, he almost exclusively played good-natured drunks and would do so until the end of his career. I wouldn't see a dog stay out on a night like this. Thank you, In 1932, he made his first appearance with Laurel and Hardy in Scram. Might I ask what you're doing here? Isn't this my house? It certainly is not. Maybe I better go there. Maybe you had. He scared up more laughs with the boys two years later as the title character in The Live Ghost. Artie made three more pictures with Stan and Ollie, but only in brief cameos. His last was as, you guessed it, a drunk in 1939's The Flying Deuces. Hidden behind the laughs of Artie's performances was a real-life alcohol problem. He died at age 52 after contracting pneumonia. And although the columbarium is closed, we can still honor a very funny man who left his mark in comedy history. High upon the bluffs overlooking Corona del Mar is Pacific View Memorial Park. Its lush grounds, swept by ocean breezes, is the very picture of serenity and is the perfect setting to reflect on the two players in Laurel and Hardy's story who rest here. In Lagunita Court is the Alcove of Faith. And here we find William Austin. After a brief run on the stage, Austin made the move to Hollywood, playing bit parts in short films. His biggest break came when he played the it girl Clara Bow's cheeky friend in her seminal performance in 1927's It. That same year, he appeared in Duck Soup, Laurel and Hardy's first pairing as co-leads. Austin's stiff upper crust character with monocle and top hat 
was the type of role that he became known for. Being the son of a wealthy sugar plantation owner in British Guiana, he was familiar with haughty upper-class English mannerisms that he could mimic with full comic effect. In 1927, Austin signed a five-year contract with Paramount Studios that expired in 1932, which was the same year he made his second and unfortunately last appearance with Laurel and Hardy. In the county hospital, he's Ollie's exuberant roommate with the shrill laugh. This time he's dressed in pajamas, but still sporting a monocle. And thanks to Stan's wardrobe mix-up, his trousers get an unfortunate alteration. The role that William Austin is perhaps best remembered for today is as Bruce Wayne's loyal butler Alfred in Columbia Pictures' 1943 serial, Batman. The curse of the By 1950, Austin had drifted away from Hollywood and lived a long, quiet life near the California coast. And if he knew that his work is still being talked about, makes me wonder what he'd have to say. Our next visit is on Bayview Terrace, and this person needs no introduction. 1949 was a busy year for John Wayne. He had three films released that year, The Sands of Iwo Jima, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, and the self-produced frontier adventure, Strange Caravan. The project included a surprise bit of casting. Playing John Wayne's sidekick and comic relief was Oliver Hardy. When the picture was released, it had a new title, The Fighting Kentuckian, and opened to favorable reviews. Reporters noticed the absence of Stan Laurel, and Ollie had to frequently deny rumors that they were no longer working together. He said that he made the film with his partner's blessing, and the split was only temporary until they could get more projects lined up. He added that his entire salary was going into their joint corporation. John Wayne, who was a personal friend of Babe, is said to have enjoyed their on-screen chemistry so much that he offered to make him his permanent sidekick. But Ollie humbly declined, citing that he already had a partner. John Wayne was already a big star in 1949, yet some of his most important films were still ahead of him. He received an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1970 for True Grit, but by then he had long been an icon of Hollywood's golden age and was, and is, the greatest film cowboy of all time. For this next segment, let's leave the cemetery and take a look at a few of the places where the boys filmed some classic scenes. Years after Stan and Ollie retired and passed on, a small number of devoted fans who had only seen their films on television were curious to discover what remained of the places where their favorite movies were made. Long before the internet and Google Earth, at a time when gas was cheap and traffic wasn't quite as bad as it is today, these determined explorers, equipped only with movie stills, street maps, and a lot of luck, crisscrossed LA. Their first and most obvious location was Culver City, the home of Roach Studios, and the backdrop for many of its films. Culver City was incorporated in 1917 and was the brainchild of real estate developer Harry H. Culver. Today, this statue of Harry is located at another brainchild of his, the Culver Hotel. Built in 1924, 
the hotel was at the epicenter of the motion picture industry that grew in the area. Consequently, it became a popular hangout for many Hollywood A-listers. Today, the Culver Hotel is recognized as a historic landmark, which is owed in part to its being used in many classic films. Laurel and Hardy fans should have no trouble recognizing the front entrance from two silent classics, Leave Em Laughing and Putting Pants on Philip. The area to the northeast of the Culver used to be the Adams Hotel, which is now long gone. But where you see the Main Street sign is the place where Jean Harlow made one of her first on-screen appearances in Liberty. A block to the north of the Culver Hotel at Bagley Avenue and Venice Boulevard is a more obscure but no less famous location. Famous because the film in which it appears is now lost. It's where the climax of the fabled Hats Off took place. From the Hats Off intersection, we go a few blocks south on Culver Boulevard to our next location. Culver City has always welcomed filmmakers, to the extent that they even allowed them to alter the facade of its city hall, turning it into the county hospital. The old Culver City Hall was replaced but a recreation of the classic facade stands in the original footprint. From downtown, we go to Dunlear Drive in the suburb of Cheviot Hills. Strolling through this peaceful neighborhood, you would never know that one of the greatest domestic disturbances in LA history took place at this little home in 1929. The film was big business, and it shows that the stock market wasn't the only thing to crash that year. And it all began with a disagreement over a Christmas tree. After some big business, we move on to the perfect day. This house on Vera Avenue in Culver City was only a stone's throw from Roach Studios. In fact, a few stones and some other things were thrown here. And then the family Model T exploded. And it happened all right here in front of this little house. Some of Stan and Ollie's filming locations are so iconic that they can be called characters in their own right. There is no truer example of this than a set of stairs found just off Sunset Boulevard in the community of Silver Lake. Pardon me, Mr. Postman. Yes, sir. Could you tell me where 1127 Walnut Avenue is? 1127 Walnut Avenue? Yes, sir. That's the house up there, right on top of the stoop. That's the house up there, right on top of the stoop. The location's place in pop culture is so significant that the city of Los Angeles has placed a marker on the spot for all to see. And ever since their rediscovery in the 1970s, the steps are visited by Laurel and Hardy fans from around the world. Climbing the steps takes you back to when you first saw the music box. 
and each step recalls a shared memory for fans who can mark the place where the boys meet Lily and Irene, and the piano makes its first plunge down to the sidewalk. Would you gentlemen please let me pass? Why, certainly, ma'am, by just a moment. Further along, if you pause and listen, you can almost hear them grunt and groan as they carry their heavy burden up and up. About the time you feel the burning in your legs, you've reached the place where an irate Billy Gilbert enters the scene. But walk around? Me, Professor Theodore Bunch Wassenhofer, should walk around? Get that thing out of my way! Get out of my way! Come on, get out of the way! You fellas carry that piano all the way up these stairs? You didn't have to do that. You see that road down there? All you had to do was to drive around that road to the top here. When you reach the top, you can finally appreciate that what goes up must inevitably come down. The locations we have visited hold a deep and profound meaning to all who have a connection to Stan and Ollie, because nowhere else gives you a better sense of being in their presence and the feeling that they could come walking around the corner at any moment. We've come to the end of the first part of our look at Laurel and Hardy's co-stars. I hope you enjoyed our time together, and I also hope you'll stick around when our exploration continues in part two. We will visit LA's premier burying ground for show business's greatest stars, past and present. Plus, we will pay our respects to those whose final resting places are unknown. From there, we will examine the lives of some key players in Stan and Ollie's career. Finally, our focus will turn to the boys themselves as we look at how they became comedy legends. If you have a favorite Laurel and Hardy film or moment, please share it in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, please let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, please do so now and be sure to click the notification bell to receive future updates. In the meantime, let's pull our jalopy over to the side of the road and park for a while. Thank you, boys. Where will you be when I need you? Right here. Okay. I would like to send thanks to Arthur Dark of Hollywood Graveyard for his generosity in this project. If exploring famous graves is your thing and you haven't been to his channel, you really need to check it out now. His work is some of the best on YouTube, and I have included a link in the description below. Tell him Grave Exploration sent you. And I want to express my sincerest thanks to my Patreons, whose financial support helped make videos like this possible. Quite simply, I couldn't do it without you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Finally, thank you for watching. I hope you'll join me in the next Grave Explorations. <laughs>